Hello everyone and welcome to FAIR's free monthly webinar series. My name is Mike Spigler and I'm the Vice President of Education for FAIR. I will be your moderator uh, today and we'll be taking your questions throughout the broadcast using both the questions and chat features that are in the toolbar on the right hand side of your screen. Please note this is the only way to interact with us today as all attendees will be muted. If time permits, which I believe it will, we will give our presenters an opportunity to respond to questions at the end of the presentation. This presentation, as are all of FAIR's webinars, will be recorded and posted on the FAIR website in about seven to 10 days. We are very thankful uh, that this month's webinar was made possible through generous support uh, from Quest Diagnostics. Let's give us one second. There you go. For more information on our sponsor, please visit www.questdiagnostics.com. Today's presenters are very well known to the food allergy community, and we are honored to have them travel to the FAIR offices today to join us. First, Gina Mennett Lee is a nationally recognized food allergy educator, advocate, and consultant who specializes in the management of food allergies in the school setting. She holds a master's degree in educational leadership and BS degrees in both elementary and special education. She is the founder of Food Allergy Education Network and the director of the National Allergy and Anaphylaxis Council. In addition, she is the owner of a private food allergy consulting firm, Men at Lee LLC, and serves as an expert contributor to the Allergy Home website. She recently served as an expert witness in the landmark Iowa food allergy case, Nutson versus Tiger Tots Community Child Care Center Corporation, and has appeared in, in or contributed to numerous television, online, and print media sources regarding the topic of food allergy management. <clears throat> Co-author of the soon-to-be-released Food Allergy Management in Early Care Settings. Her uh, partner in this presentation today is Laurel Francoeur, Esquire. She graduated from MIT with a Bachelor of Science degree in Political Science with a minor in Philosophy. She's a graduate of Suffolk Law School and has been a practicing lawyer since 1996. She is a sport group leader for the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America and served on their board of directors. She is currently a patient advocate for APA and Education Project Manager of Kids with Food Allergies Foundation. She also is co-owner of Green Laurel Documents, an online allergy resource company specializing in customized food allergy plans. She's also co-author of the soon-to-be-released Food Allergy Management in Early Care Settings. We are proud to welcome Gina and Laurel. Thank you for having us, Mike. This is Laurel. And we wanted to start out talking about the challenges that preschool face. So, First of all, we wanted to talk about the challenges for adults, for the parents of the children uh, with preschool age uh, kids with food allergies. And we identified a few basic points. First, the parent may be placing the child in the care of someone else for the first time. So this may be the first time that a parent is giving up control of watching their child and entrusting someone else to watch their child during the day. Another issue is parents of toddlers are usually newly diagnosed. Children are newly diagnosed with food allergies, so the parents have their own learning curve to learn about what allergies entail and how to handle allergies themselves. They also will encounter varying degrees of knowledge of those caring for the child, so you don't know how the community understands food allergies and whether they're up to speed on everything they need to know. Another big issue is an allergen for your child may be an important part of the diet of another child, and the instance here is milk. Your child may be allergic to milk, and milk tends to be a, a staple for many toddlers and infants. So you may have to worry about how that is going to be accommodated. And lastly, there's a fear of using epinephrine, um, both on the parent's part and, uh, as we'll talk a little later, there's a fear on the provider's part of using epinephrine. We also have some issues um, that are related to just the, the growth and development of the child, the fact that they're very young. They cannot articulate what they're feeling. Um, they may not have awareness of the symptoms, so they may not be able to have the language skills to be able to tell a provider I'm having a reaction. Um, they also explore surroundings through all of their senses, especially with their mouth. Infants and toddlers love to put things in their mouth, and that can pose a problem if they put something in their mouth that either is an allergen or is contaminated with an allergen. They also are crawling on the floor, and there may be crumbs and different things on the floor that are of an issue. Also, they have fine and gross motor skills that are not fully developed. 
so they're not very good at handling objects and foods and may be tend to spill things and, and that sort of thing. And lastly, we find in preschool the issue of sharing is a very important lesson that's taught. And for toddlers with food allergies, they really need to be taught that sharing food is not okay. And this may be counter to all of the other lessons they're learning in preschool about sharing of toys and so forth. And now I'm going to turn it over to Gina for the next part of the presentation. Thank you, Laurel. Um, I wanted to first bring up some important research that was published in um, June 2012 in pediatrics it regarded allergic reactions to foods in the preschool setting. Um, we had some excellent findings that gave us clues to how we need to educate people that are caring for children in this age group. And one of the findings was that the majority of reactions were to um, milk, in fact, and not to peanuts. So we need to think about that when we're addressing strategies to uh, reduce exposure to allergens. We also found that accidental exposures were attributed to label reading errors, unintentional ingestion, and cross-contact. Um, this will inform what kind of education needs to take place. And then one of the most disturbing facts that came out of this was that 11% um, were intentional ingestion, meaning that uh, the parent or caregiver actually gave the child food that they were um, known to be allergic to. So again, it's really important that we're educating people about avoiding the allergen. 29.9% of severe reactions were treated with epinephrine, meaning that 70% were not. So again, this goes to education. We really need to be teaching people um, the following factors, which are, one, that you need to recognize the severity of a reaction. Two, uh, you need to make sure that epinephrine is readily avail available. And three, you need to make sure that there are no fears around um, <coughs> injecting the epinephrine. And I like to say to people, um, if epinephrine were in the form of something else, like a pill or a liquid that you were drinking, would you have that hesitation of using the epinephrine? Um, and if the answer is no, then that means you really should be um, using that epinephrine and not be afraid of the needle. Um, Dr. Pissner had shared that um, the needle is about the width of a dime and is similar to a flu shot needle. This is actually um, an excellent chart that I use when I'm educating schools. It, it goes over the types of um, exposures because it's not just ingesting the allergen that you need to be concerned about. There's other ways that a child can be exposed to an allergen. And those three ways are um, oral exposure, uh, skin exposure, and inhalation. Inhalation is when you're cooking or heating an allergen and it becomes airborne, or it could be when dealing with powders or small particles. And oral exposure can also mean um, if you have a cross-contact issue. So it can be unintentional and not just eating the actual thing that the child is allergic to, but eating something that may have touched the allergen. The biggest piece of data from that chart that I referred to before um, is this statistic, and that's that children ages two to five put hands and objects in their mouth approximately 40 times per hour, and then ages two, one to two, it's 80 times per hour. So this means that we really need to be discussing um, strategies to prevent a reaction. Children can touch an allergen and then touch their eyes, nose, or mouth, and that can cause a reaction. So now we're going to discuss the role of the preschool. And as a parent, and when you're looking at preschools, you should be asking if they have a written plan in place. So schools should be developing a written food allergy management and prevention plan. And all this information is taken from the newly re released CDC guidelines. Those were released um, back in November, and these are readily available online. These guidelines provide five priorities that schools need to be looking at when creating this plan. And the first priority is the daily management of food allergies for individual children. This plan, in my opinion and in morals, really needs to be written. It needs to com contain the following information. Um, you need to have the information from the healthcare provider, including the diagnosis, the child's allergens, and their reaction history. 
strategies to prevent exposure to allergens, strategies to keep the child fully included in all aspects of the day, and the emergency action plan. The benefit of having a written plan um, in the preschool setting is one that both the provider and the parents are clear on the expectations and know what needs to be done. But then two, when the child transitions to kindergarten, they will, it will be a useful tool for helping that new school to plan for that child. One of, the fa one of the parts of the plan that I would like to spend some time on is the strategies for reducing exposure to allergens. Um, this following list is not an all-inclusive list, um, but they're suggested best practices from the CDC guidelines, and children may need additional accommodations depending on their allergies and the unique setting of the school that they're entering. The first is uh, the use of non-food incentives for prizes, gifts, and awards. Um, we featured here a picture from Oriental Trading. Um, Oriental Trading is a good resource. Uh, Dollar Tree, Target, you can find little things like erasers and pencils. I guess make sure they're not chokeable though. <laughs> um, but my motto is that the best reward we can give our children is really our time and attention. So thinking beyond trinkets is, is a good idea too. Um, having special time to spend with the teacher, making the child a hero for the day, for their birthday. And um, I'll share just a brief anecdote. Um, a close friend of mine's son was um, in preschool and had surgery, and the preschool um, created a big, huge card and had each child put their handprint and sign it. And that card ended up having a place of honor in his house for, for several years. So thinking beyond um, food is always a good idea. And then we need to discuss methods to prevent cross-contact. Um, the CDC guidelines say when storing food, but you need to really be thinking about food from the time it's manufactured and or grown to the time that it actually reaches the person's plate. So there are all opportunities for cross-contact. And cross-contact is when um, there's an unintentional allergen present. For example, if you're um, bringing watermelon um, and you cut the watermelon and you had used a sponge to wash the cutting board, but that sponge was earlier used that day to wash up milk, you're actually, instead of cleaning that cutting board, spreading those milk proteins. So it's important that people understand how to avoid cross-contact in all areas. One, um, one strategy that I know some preschools use is a, using a separate refrigerator for the allergen-containing foods and also having a separate area for lunch bags rather than throwing them into like one common bin. A really important strategy for children of all ages is hand washing before and after consuming or handling food. And this means not just food when they're eating, but food that they may be handling um, for crafts or other activities. Um, the big takeaway from this is that hand sanitizer is not appropriate for this. It will not remove food proteins. You need to use soap and water and or uh, commercial wipes for this purpose. And of course, you want to avoid the use of allergens in class projects, parties, holidays, celebrations. Basically, you just want to make sure that that space that the child is in is as safe as possible. Another one is washing tables, chairs, and any other eating area with approved cleaner before each meal and snack. Again, I'd refer to sponges. Sponges are not a good idea. You want to use maybe disposable things or something you can wash and you use a fresh, a fresh cloth each time. You also want to make sure to clean toys and other things that children may be putting into their mouth regularly. This was not mentioned in the CDC guidelines, but I think it's really important for this setting. Um, some of the preschool settings uh, they don't have a separate area, a lunchroom, so it's important that if you're in one space that you try to separate the learning area from the playing area. Um, this just, one, helps, again, not for the cross-contact issue, but then it also helps the provider to be able to easily clean up afterwards. I just wanted to make sure to share this resource from um, Kids with Food Allergies. It's a list of potential food allergens in craft supplies. So this is a good thing to share with your preschool provider. 
Uh, priority two is preparing for food allergy emergencies. So once we have those strategies in place to uh, prevent a reaction, we want to make sure that we're also prepared for these emergencies. One, you want to make sure that you set up a communication system. This could be walkie-talkies, uh, making sure your phones are operational and or cell phones. Um, make sure you have quick and easy access to epinephrine. This is, of course, dependent upon state law, but it should not be locked and put away. Um, one strategy that has worked well in some of the schools that I've worked with is having um, a hook that's up high enough for the adults to access, but the children are unable to access them, and hanging um, a pencil bag with the epinephrine in it. Um, also make sure to use epinephrine when needed, as we were discussing earlier. It's really important that you use the epi when needed and call 911 as soon as possible. Identify the role of each staff member in the food allergy emergency so they're not unprepared. And then you also need to make sure that you're preparing for food allergy emergencies in children without prior history. Um, I made up. <laughs> Hi, folks. Hopefully you can hear us again now. It looks like you can. I apologize. We had a bit of a phone hiccup here in the office, uh, so we will get started again. So that's the joy of, of going live. This is fun. <laughs> so we're on, um, I think, staff training. So you want to have the general training for um, food allergies for all staff and then the in-depth training for the staff with frequent contact. Um, I was stating that there are really good resources online that are free. Um, AllergyReady.com is an excellent online tool. Allergy Home has some modules. And then the National Education Association Health Info Network just released a um, video for this purpose. I also wanted to mention, too, that um, FAIR will be relaunching or releasing their Safe at Schools program um, this fall, which is also another tool. So I wanted to give you the actual resources that you can use to train your staff. So one of the um, points that you want to make is uh, recognizing the signs and symptoms of an allergic reaction. So here's an actual downloadable resource that you can use for the staff. Um, you can also hang this up in the classroom. And this is um, from FAIR and available online. This also is from FAIR and available online. and this is just uh, how a child might describe a reaction. This relates back to those challenges that, that Laurel discussed at the beginning. So this would, again, be another great thing to download and share with staff or anyone that's caring for a young child with food allergies. And then, again, FAIR has these really great um, how to read a food label um, sheets that you can look at. So depending on the child's allergy, you can look at the words that you need to look for when reading labels. I also think it's important that you um, 
discuss this with parents because they're going to be your best resource. They're the ones that do this day in and day out and really are the label reading experts for their child. You also want to make sure that you know how to use the epinephrine. Again, all of these websites have videos to show how to use these devices. Um, I know that some people are still unaware of the AviQ in the upper left hand corner. That is a voice guided device. So if you're not aware of that, you might want to check that out and look, look for that. Priority four is making sure that you educate all children and family members about food allergies. Um, it's really important that children and families all children and families be embraced and, and seen as valuable members of the community. And sometimes the prevention strategies that we put in place require other people to help and be cooperative, um, such as maybe food restrictions or hand washing. So it's really important for people to understand why these measures are necessary, and that begins with education. So you want to teach all children about food allergies, and you want to teach the parents and families about food allergies. It's also important to discuss the way that you state things. Um, it's not a good idea to state, oh, you know, Johnny has a milk allergy, so we're no, no longer able to do that craft using the milk carton. Instead, make um, broader statements, like we have some new policies in place to ensure that all of our children are safe and included at our school. The Via Pal program is great. It's another resource from FAIR and is um, found online. And it's a good way to address food allergies with children because it's simple and age appropriate and basically encourages children to be um, good friends to each other. Another good resource I found on the FAIR website was this infographic. And I think this is a great thing to have, again, posted up somewhere in, um, in the preschool setting. And then you could also download it and send it to the parents. And this just brings about some awareness about food allergies. Now there are so many really great educational resources that I even hesitated to put some of these down, but I just wanted to share a few with you. Um, a book that I really, two books that I really like are the Bug of Bees books, and then there's a whole Alexander the Elephant series available through FAIR. Um, there are great videos from Allergy Home, um, Binky Goes Nuts, Alexander the Elephant, and then Hayden's Food Allergy video is actually a YouTube video by a young child with food allergies. And then, of course, we all love um, Kyle Dine. He has excellent music. And then the Be Pal program that we discussed before and all of those posters that we had discussed before. Priority five is creating and maintaining a healthy and safe educational environment. This includes all of the measures that we discussed before, but some additional measures. And that's really creating an environment to make children feel safe and secure. So you want to make sure that you have all those strategies in place to reduce exposure to allergens and to reduce cross-contact. Um, there's a bullying. You want to make sure you're addressing bullying. I don't find that there's a lot of bullying in the preschool setting, but by educating the children and the families, you're helping to lay the groundwork for, um, for later years when approximately one-third of the children um, are bullied specifically due to their allergies. If there's more education, hopefully there'll, there'll be less of that um, bullying. And then in the quality of life, um, surveys and research, they found that one of the biggest difficulties for parents and families dealing with food allergies was the isolation. So we want to make sure that we're not isolating parents socially. So if you have a, um, a big event where everybody is invited, try to take into consideration ways to make that event um, safe for everybody. Lastly, I'm going to be talking about the role of the parents. First and foremost, you want to make sure that you notify the school of your child's allergies. Otherwise, they can't put in any um, strategies to address his or her allergies. Two, you want to make sure you're bringing the medications to the school. If they don't have the epinephrine available, they can't use it. Three, you want to provide that emergency care plan from your child's pediatric allergist and or other health care professional. You want to work with your preschool daycare provider to create an appropriate plan for your child. That's those accommodations that we had discussed before in that written plan. Let them know that you support them and that it's okay to use epinephrine. Because there is 
the fear around using epinephrine, it's really important that you let them know that you're looking to them to use the epinephrine when it's needed and that you, you want them to do that. Keep an open dialogue and share information and resources. Um, the, your preschool provider will, may become your biggest champion. I know when my daughter entered um, kindergarten, my preschool provider actually came with, my, came with me to the meeting um, with the kindergarten teacher, and she was really great. Encourage your child to use his medical ID. It's a good habit to start early. And then finally, because um, I come from the education world and was a teacher, it's so important that you take the time to say thank you for everything that they do on a daily basis to keep your child safe and included. And with that, I'm going to send it over to Laurel. Okay, thank you, Gina. And now we're going to talk about the laws that are involved. The first law is the Americans with Disabilities Act. And basically what this says is that people with a disability cannot be excluded from participation in or be denied the benefits of the services, programs, or activities of a public entity. Now, under Title III of the ADA, preschools, child care centers, um, even family-based child care centers are covered. Under Title II of the ADA, state and local government run care centers are also covered by the ADA. And what happened was in 2008, Congress realized that the Supreme Court had been giving the ADA a very narrow definition and they were excluding a lot of people from the definition of uh, being disabled to qualify for services under the ADA. So it was amended in 2008. And one of the things they did was they included more people in the definition of disabled. They included more major life activities, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the biggest thing that they did, which helps uh, people with food allergies, is that conditions that are episodic or in remission must be considered when they are active. So what this means is, when your child is having a food allergy reaction, it's not happening 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's an isolated event. And in the past, the courts were saying that if you had something that just happened on an intermittent basis, you weren't disabled. So they've changed the law now to say that if you have a condition that may only happen in episodes, then you have to consider that person for analysis as if they were having that episode. So that has opened up um, the definition to include a lot of different uh, things, including um, people with food allergies, because again, you're not having a reaction all day long. And so this is the definition that the ADA uses, um, and it's a person who has a physical or mental impairment which substantially limits one or more major life activities or has a record of such an impairment or is regarded as having such an impairment. The major point here to remember is it's a major life activity that's impaired. It has nothing to do with learning. Many schools get this confused and they think, well, because your child may be bright and has the ability to learn, they don't qualify for services. That's not true. It's a major life activity. And examples of life activities are things like eating, breathing, walking, um, your circulatory system, how that operates. Um, and again, under the, the amendment to the ADA, they've broadened that and included more types of activities. Um, so again, it's not learning, it's a life activity, and people sometimes get that confused. Um, another thing people say is, well, I really don't like my child to be labeled as disabled. And uh, it's really important that this isn't a label for your child. This is a legal definition, and this is a definition that will help to get some of the services that your child needs. So please don't think we're labeling your child. Okay. Um, under the ADA, what, uh, uh, what, who has to abide by it? All public schools do. Private schools that are secular, and that means they're non-religious, do have to uh, abide by it. The exception are private schools that are religiously run. They are not subject to the ADA. Um, and religiously run means that it's run by um, a church, synagogue, that type of thing. If the preschool is merely renting space 
from a church but is not affiliated with the church, then the ADA does apply. But these are ones that are specifically sponsored by um, the church or synagogue or whatever. Now, under the ADA, your child is entitled to have reasonable modifications be made to the program. And so reasonable modifications are slight changes in the way things are done so that your child can feel safe and included in the program. And I like this quote. It, it kind of gives a, a summary of what reasonable modifications are. And the idea is not to exclude a person by being unwilling to make accommodation that is fairly simple and easy to make. So if it's something very uh, simple that's not going to require a lot of effort, they are required to make those accommodations. Now, there are, unfortunately, exceptions to this. And the exceptions are you cannot require a preschool to do something that would be a fundamental alteration of their program or an undue burden. An undue burden has been held to be um, something that uh, is a financial burden. So really, that's talk about financial. Fundamental alteration is something you're asking them to do that's going to change the very nature of their program. So for instance, um, a restaurant uh, doesn't have to change its entire menu to accommodate someone with food allergies. If their specialty is one particular food that, and that's the way they operate, they're not required to change the whole nature of their restaurant. However, if they can take away one or two ingredients and make the food safer, they may have to do that under the ADA. So fundamental alteration is something that goes to really the core of the program. The second thing that they can say is that it would be a direct threat. Uh, and this is a direct threat to the health and safety of others. And it's very hard, in my opinion, to find an instance where a food allergy would be a direct threat to another child. Um, but just to be aware that those are the uh, only times when they can uh, refuse to make modifications. And if you find um, the school is going to uh, use these to deny access, the denial has to be made by the head of the preschool. It can't be made by just any employee. They have to consider all of the resources of the preschool. So if they are in, belong, for instance, to a national chain, and the chain has the money to do the things, but maybe the, the local branch doesn't, they have to take that into consideration, and it has to be put in writing. They have to give you a written reason as to why they can't make the accommodation. So under the ADA, basically we have, you can't have rules that explicitly exclude children with disabilities, and you cannot base admissions on rules that would result in discrimination. So what this means is a preschool can't have a rule that automatically, by its nature, excludes a whole class of people. And one of the examples is toilet trained. So some preschools say, we can only take children who are toilet trained. Well, that discriminates against children with disabilities who may not be able to do the toilet training themselves. So they cannot have blanket policies like that that exclude an entire group of people. Or, for instance, they can't say, um, we will never um, allow students to, uh, to uh, check for diabetes, for instance, um, because that excludes an entire class of people. Also, they can't charge you more if they need to make accommodations. So whatever tuition you pay has to be the same tuition that other parents pay. And, and lastly, they can't refuse admission because their insurance premiums are going to go up. Um, some preschools have tried this and failed. Um, they can't say, well, now because I, I'm taking a child that has uh, issues, my carrier insurance is going up. They cannot use that as a reason. If you have any questions about the ADA, here's a, a helpful information line where you can call and ask questions. Um, and also, they have a, a wonderful uh, Q&A section about uh, questions about child care, and that's the website there, and it kind of goes over the different common questions that people have. Now, what happens if you feel that you have been violated under your rights with the ADA? Well, there's two things you can do. You can complain to the Department of Justice, and they can uh, instigate an investigation. 
and they can find the school. Actually, this should be 55,000. That was a typo, not 50,000. Um, so they can find a school up to 55,000 for a first infraction and then up to 110 for a second infraction. Um, but you don't get that money. That money goes as sort of a penalty. Or you can file a private lawsuit and say you've been discriminated against under the ADA. However, you're not entitled to get damages. Um, what you can get is an injunction. And an injunction is a court order that orders the defendant to either do something or to stop doing something. So they could say, well, we order you to accept your child, um, and you might get attorney's fees. A little known fact that um, you can sort of have in your back pocket is that it a, com a, a place that makes an accommodation based on an ADA request can get a tax break for the money that it costs to make that accommodation. And um, it's for 30 or fewer employees and a total revenue of a million or less. And most preschools are small enough and have 30 or fewer employees. And they can get up to a $5,000 tax credit. So if you go to a preschool and they say, well, this is really going to cost us a lot of money, point this out. Say, well, hey, you might be able to write it off on your taxes. And um, they may be more willing to work with you. Now, Section 504, this is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. And basically, this is another disability law. This applies to entities that get federal funding. So there's some question whether it applies in the preschool setting. Um, there have been some discussions whether the age should start at three um, or whether it should be whenever school is made mandatory for children in that district, that there's some question about how young it starts. Um, but it, the main thing is it has to be a school that receives federal funds. So most public preschools will fall under this. Private preschools, you have to find a source of federal funds. And I say here, watch out for indirect funding, because some schools participate in Title I programs or uh, basically things that if the children need special services um, outside of the typical learning environment, if that is sent to the school district and the child has to go to the district for services, say for like speech therapy, then that may not pull the private preschool into 504. However, if the funding goes directly to the preschool, that may pull them in. So an example, for instance, was a case involving vouchers where um, the state gave parents vouchers to go to uh, whichever school they wanted. And when they chose a private preschool, the question was, well, now does giving the voucher bring them into 504? And it was held yes, because even though the money was going through the, from the federal to the state, it was directly ending up in the pocket of the preschool. So it did. That was enough to, um, to bring it in. Um, and just also briefly to say that um, 504 is, is interpreted differently than ADA. So it's, if you have a, a complaint, you go to the um, Department of Education Office of Civil Rights. And um, I don't think I put that on the uh, on the slide, but you can you can go to the to the website of the Department of Education, and if they can explain to you there how to file a complaint, you can also find your local branch, and they you can call them with questions. They're very um, open to answering questions for parents. Now, the last thing you have to remember is that there are also state laws and regulations in place. And these are separate from the rules that govern the elementary schools. So states have a separate division of their Department of Education for preschools. And uh, it varies from state to state. But just be aware that sometimes states will give you actually more rights than the ADA or the 504. An example of this is in Massachusetts, preschools are required for kids with food allergies to have a health care plan. So that's a state regulation. So that goes above and beyond saying you have to have a, a plan, regardless of whether 504 or ADA applies. So if you want to find out about your state, here's a wonderful website. And they list you, you pull down your state, and it will list all of the uh, the statutes and regulations related to child care in your state. So you can see what um, things that your state offers. So I'm going to briefly talk about um, 
a couple of um, real case scenarios that are appropriate to sort of give you an idea of how things um, were handled. Um, the first case was the um, La Petite Academy case, and in that case, um, a child was trying to get into a preschool who had a food allergy, and the school said, no, we can't administer epinephrine, um, so we can't admit them. And so they sued, and they came to an agreement, and they basically said that you, the school can't have this blanket policy. They have to be individualized and um, and have a policy where they will administer epinephrine. They can't just blanketly say we will never administer epinephrine. So they worked out an agreement on that. To take that one step further, there was another case where a child had diabetes and applied for a preschool, and the preschool said, well, under the state law, there are certain things we can't do in terms of treating for diabetes. And they came to an agreement with the Department of Justice basically saying that the preschool will ask for a waiver from that law so that they can accept children with diabetes. So even though the school might say, well, there's a law saying we can't give epinephrine, there have been exceptions where they've been made to ask for a waiver of that so that they can admit people. Um, and also, this month's Allergic Living, um, an article that was written by Gina, um, talks about the Knutson case. And you can read about it in this month's Allergic Living on page 62, and it's a good discussion of how a scenario went wrong and the cautionary tale of what people can do to protect themselves going forward in the future. So these are the takeaways points we hope you come away with today. First, you should have a written plan with your school. It doesn't matter whether you call it a 504 or whatever you call it, it should be in writing. Everybody should be on the same page and understand where things are going on, what you're going to, to do to help protect the child. The school should also have food allergy policies in place. So when you're shopping around for preschool, look for one that's already tackled these issues and has a policy in place. And find a school that's willing to work with you. If they seem hesitant or resistant to do things, you might not want to place your child there. Um, and then chances are ADA and perhaps even 504 will apply. Again, this is a religious exception. Um, but so chances are that they will be required to make accommodations. So just keep that in the back of your mind that, um, that is, the law is really in favor of uh, the school having to make the accommodations rather than not. Um, make sure that when your child is there, you have procedures in place to reduce exposures to allergens, and we talked about ways to do that. Make sure the staff is educated about food allergies and make sure that they know how to treat a reaction. So all of those things are, we hope that you've taken away from this webinar. And with that, I think we will turn to questions. Great. And, and go ahead. Mark. Oh, yeah, sorry. Last day, I just wanted to put, we put together some uh, resources um, just so that if you need more information, um, there's things there. Um, Fair, and we talked about the, the PAL program, the posters, the educational materials. Um, kids with food allergies, they have that list of the allergens and craft materials. They have recipes if you're looking for meals to make for your kid to send to school. Allergy Home is where we got that chart about the allergen exposure, and they have posters and modules. AllergyReady.com is what we talked about, the online training. CDC guidelines, always important. and um, that's the food allergy handbook at the bottom that we referenced to. Great. Thank you so. Whoops. Thank you so much. So uh, a lot of the questions we got early on, you guys answered later on. So I think that's a sign of a pretty robust presentation. Um, but uh, we did a couple questions, kind of clarity issues on some of the points you were talking about, uh, Laurel, regarding um, what applies to whom. Uh, one question was uh, just for clarification. Does ADA apply to a non-secular preschool that does not receive any federal funding? Yes. Yes. A non-secular. So, so. A non. A, a, a so. Uh, so it, yes, a religious preschool. Okay. So no. So ADA does not apply to a religious preschool. 504 may if the religious preschool gets federal funding. It's unclear whether they would or not, but. Um, under the ADA, a religious preschool does not have to follow the ADA. Great. And then one question you ha uh, came up, again, kind of a clarifying piece. 
you talked a little bit about the state laws and regulation. A question came in from a parent of someone that has a child going to preschool uh, that does not receive any federal funding but does receive lots of state funding. So what might apply to them depend, it, depending on that? Okay, I'm assuming it's, again, not religious. If it's not religious, chances are the ADA will apply. So um, you, and they, you are entitled to modifications under the ADA. So if they get federal funding, that would pull 504 in as well. But ADA itself is enough to get some of the things that you need in place. So that may be adequate enough. But state funds will not bring them in for 504, but ADA certainly they will qualify for. Any advice on how you would go about finding out what a preschool receives from a funding standpoint? Federal, That's always state. a hard one. You sort of have to be a detective. But some of the things you can look for are, do they participate in the National School Lunch Program? Some of them do. Um, Head Start. That's another issue. Do they uh, take money from Head Start? There's a lot of grants now. Um, the Race to the Top has grants now for preschools. So you can try to find out if they participate in any of that. Um, any other grants that they might receive for nutrition or healthy schools or safe schools, um, those are different places you can look. But you sort of have to be a detective, unfortunately. Okay. And this is a bit off topic, but given your vast experience in food allergies, this was the very first question we got in, and I, I've gotten this question a lot. It's a bit off topic. but. Any tips for getting both parents involved in this process? Uh, I'm sure that was probably from a mom. <laughs> uh, either from your personal experience or in running support groups that, that you found effective? Do you want to speak to um, Well, especially when entering the schools, if you do get into some of these high-stake meetings like a 504 meeting, I just think it's important to have a united front. And so I just told my husband, you're coming. <laughs> you need to come. Uh, you don't need to talk, but you need to sit there and um, and and be my uh, be my rock. And uh, you can also give them something to do. Like I had my husband um, take notes for me because I was speaking a lot. So sometimes if if um, the person's hesitant because they they don't know how to act in that setting, giving them something like you know take notes so that we we have an accurate accounting of what took place and you don't have to be a verbal participant is helpful. Have you seen any forms that daycares have used or you know, what would you recommend from just kind of an institutionalized policy for collecting information on food allergies when these kids are being enrolled in the first place? Any tips on preschools for setting something like that up? Almost all preschools have some kind of form that you need to fill out, so I think it can be as easy as a little um, area that says, does your child have any medical conditions, please? <laughs> please specify. And then the, the schools can do a little bit more of investigating after that. When they, if they see food allergies and say, okay, we need to now put this child into a separate process to come up with a plan. And there are some preschools who have their food allergy policies online. So you can Google preschool food allergy policies and find what other schools have done and modify that for your needs if you're looking as far as policy. Great. Given the special circumstances for some religious uh, preschools, any have you seen any come across any guidance that any of the church or religious organizations have point out uh, put together around food allergies that you've seen just to to help them plan given the the special circumstances around them? It really depends on the organization. I know that um, from my own experience, some churches have what they call a covenant of welcoming in which they're trying to make policies that are as welcoming as possible for all children, and they may address food allergies that way. Um, but as far as a formal policy, I, I don't know of one. Um, I think the trend probably is for them to do more on their own because they are seeing the rise in food allergies, and they want to do the right thing, and they want to be inclusive. But I'm not sure if I know of anything that is mandated. Yeah. We've gotten lots of questions about will the slides be available. Everyone's very eager to see those resources you provided. We will provide those slides. They'll be up on the site in about seven to ten days. Um, you can also feel free to email me in the meantime, and I, I can get you out a particular one if you'd like. My email address is mspigler at foodallergy.org. We also wanted to mention that we're going to be publishing a book about all of these um, things, and then we're going to be elaborating and giving examples. So that book should be coming out in the coming months. So be on the lookout for that if you want more resources and more detail. Great, 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 great. That sounds like it'll be a great resource. Um, 
I think that a lot of the questions we got are very similar. I think uh, lots of clarification questions regarding the religious uh, piece, but I think your book will probably cover a lot of that uh, part. Um, yeah, the thing with religious is that it, it has to be sponsored by by a religious institution. So, for instance, um, if it's using, say, the Catholic Church as an example, if it's a parish preschool that's part of the parish and they get funding from the parish, then that's considered a religious preschool, and then ADA does not apply. If, however, it's an outside group that is renting the parish and using the parish space, for the preschool, but they are an independent group totally separate from the church, they just happen to be using the space, then the ADA does apply. So I don't know if that helps. Does, yeah, yeah. Great. Well, I think that is it. Lots of thank yous from the audience. So uh, let me also extend the thank you as well uh, to our presenters for a great job. A quick preview of uh, next month's webinar. Uh, which will be uh, on uh, August 20th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern, and will feature uh, our uh, Fair's Director of Education, Gina Klaus. Uh, it'll be covering, uh, entitled, What Every Parent Must Know About Managing Food Allergies in School, and be kind of an, almost a bit of an extension on this program as moving into K through 12. So uh, member registration will open on Friday, uh, and then anyone can register starting on July 21st. So uh, thank you again. The slides again will be available in about, and the presentation up in about seven to 10 days on our website. Uh, just search under webinars. All right, thank you very much. That concludes our broadcast for today.